Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our NSWOC and Walk Institute continuing education webinar. We've got a really awesome topic today on complex wounds, sharp and enzymatic uh, debridement. And uh, before anything else, I want to do a quick little icebreaker with all of you. Um, if you can take uh, your chat tool and your Zoom toolbar there and just punch in where you're tuning in from. My name's Troy. I'm the Director of Operations for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada. I'm tuning in from Ottawa, Ontario, and it's exciting to see all these people. I can already see in the chat from all across Canada. We got BC, we have Nova Scotia, Ontario, uh, more Ontario, more BC, everywhere. We love to see it. And I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Kevin Wu, who we'll introduce in a second, as well as our friends at Smith and Nephew who are making this education possible. Today, we have uh, both Sub and Kimberly who are going to be along for the ride with us to do a little bit of a presentation at the beginning and be in the background here to help answer some of your questions as we go through the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kevin Wu. Uh, Dr. Kevin Wu is a full professor, uh, professor at Queen's University, Faculty of Health Sciences in Kingston, Ontario, and he's an adjunct research professor at Western University. He's also an affiliate scientist at the Institute for Education Research, or TIER, uh, University Health Network. He is known as an established Canadian researcher and educator in the fields of wound management and chronic disease management. And he has over 180 peer-reviewed papers. Uh, I'm sorry, he has published over 180 uh, peer-reviewed papers and received national and international awards for his work. Dr. Wu serves as the chair of the Joint Research Ethics Board for the West Park Health Center in Toronto, Grace Health Center in Toronto, and he's a founding me member and the past president of the Canadian Pressure Injury Advisory Panel, and he maintains an active clinical role in wound care. Um, great. Thank you, um, Troy, and thank you so much uh, for Smith and Nephew to sponsor this event for me to talk to you this evening about shop and enzymatic debridement. Um, debride, debride, whatever you like in terms of the pronunciation. Uh, but I think we're talking about cleaning up the wound bed to prepare for wound healing purposes. So welcome everyone. It's lovely to see so many people uh, joining us uh, this evening. So and, and I, I always love to bring back to a slide like this, that whatever topic that we want to talk about, in this case, we'll be focusing a little bit more about debridement technique, debridement, the different types of debridement, uh, specifically about sharp and enzymatic debridement methodology. But the most important component is, is stepping back to look at the holistic assessment prior to our local wound management. So we need to assess our patient in terms of what type of wounds we're talking about, the type of patients that we, we, we're caring for and the well-being. We want to bring in multidisciplinary team together to promote holistic uh, wound care management. I think some questions was wonderful earlier to talk about, you know, how often do you have access to a wound care team? How often do you have access to someone who can do shop deployment, for example, if that's not within your scope of practice? Then, of course, I think we... Uh, part of the purpose of bringing the team together is to treat and control the underlying problems and barriers that can impede wound healing process. And then we can design a local wound management. Just a reminder, I'm sure that this is no surprise and, and not a uh, new information for most of you in the, in the audience at the moment. So it's a T-I-M-E in terms of local wound management, T for tissue debridement or looking at how we can remove non viable tissue to prepare for healthy wound bed or wound healing purpose. And then infection, inflammation, moisture balance and edge effect. <clears throat> I, I, I think, you know, when you look at this circle, they seem to be very, very discreet. In my mind, I think they're overlapping and more overlapping space than you think. Because if you can remove the non viable tissue, perhaps we can address infection better and we can reduce the inflammatory response in the wound. With reduction in inflammation, we can actually control the moisture, uh, the moisture, the excess amount of fluid produced from the wound environment, so we can promote better edge advancement. So you can see that, you know, TIME is not a, 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 is not, I don't think the idea is to convey the discrete entity from, from each component, but I think they're overlapping. And often we have to think of strategies that can address all different components. So <clears throat> come back to debridement. So the term debridement uh, has been around for quite some time. And actually, if you care to look at some history, um, the uh, Enswalk debridement document is actually quite informative. 
telling you a little bit about the story behind the Brightman and and uh, and how it has evolved over time. So <clears throat> in general, we use the term the Brightman to refer to the removal of necrotic tissue, scabs, devitalized tissue, dry fluids, and maybe sometimes some of the uh, stratified epidermis, pus, blood clots, bone bodies, bone fragments, and other foreign bodies that we don't want to be in the wound environment. So people often ask me, okay, when you look at this piece of tissue, it looks kind of grayish and it's not pink. And is it necrotic tissue? Is it divitalized tissue? Is it non-viable tissue? Is it ash Is it sloth? Well, <clears throat> does it really matter? We know that those materials doesn't belong to the wound, so we need to remove them. I usually just say, if you don't know what it is, just say it is a unhealthy, non, you know, unhealthy tissue that need to be removed or cleaned up to promote better wound bed. So there are different types of debridement method, and we'll come back to talk more in more detail about each individual method. You have to exercise um, uh, the, your judgment. And, and, and evaluate, reflect on your knowledge, skill, and the equipment available to you to perform this specific procedure. <clears throat> and, and I'm not just talking about sharp debridement because even with me mechanical, even with autolytic debridement, if it's not being done correctly, it has some significant consequences and risk that we put on patient's health. For example, for an individual with a necrotic toe, if you start promoting autolytic debridement, if there's no circulation and there's non viable tissue there, it can actually enhance bacterial growth, leading to sepsis and other really um, significant adverse events. So you can see that it's not just about sharp debridement that has um, that has risk that carry the risk, but also other type of debridement. Yes, I think we place a lot of emphasis on sharp debridement because the risk is much higher compared to autolytic or mechanical deployment or enzymatic deployment in this case. So I love this slide by, um, by Stephen Percival and his group uh, published in Journal of Wound Care with depicting that in the, uh, the, the, the milieu within the wound environment, you can see the wound dressing on top, the wound bed on the bottom here. And in between, you got all this wound fluid, sloughy tissue, and uh, all the other material. And what you see, uh, if you cannot see already, a biofilm, 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 biofilm. So in other words, um, it's kind of ubiquitous within this micro environment. And we do need to think about how we can address biofilm. And recently, again, we, I have another presentation specifically talking about wound infection and biofilm. Hopefully you're convinced that uh, biofilm is, is one of the major barriers for wound healing. And it's very, very stubborn, very recalcitrant to regular treatment. We do need to think about different ways of disturbing and disrupting the biofilm structure. And from my perspective today, to this day, the most effective way is doing some type of physical debridement. And based on some of the studies, and unfortunately, we don't really have better studies to illustrate this point. This study was being done almost 15, 20 years ago. What they did was uh, comparing a retrospective or some analyses, looking at people who were receiving growth factors. And they noticed that some people uh, from certain clinics and they received regular debridement actually imp uh, have, they, they heal faster whether they're using the growth factors or not, they're doing much better than clinics and groups that are not doing regular debridement. So the what we can extrapolate from the result is that debridement is good for wound healing, especially for people in this case with diabetic foot ulcer. And that's consistent with the step down, step up clinical method that we need to be as aggressive in terms of removing all the non-viable tissue and healthy material in the wound bed as early, as quickly as possible, in addition to all, all the other components of, uh, of local wound management, whether we need to think about using uh, use the, uh, topical antiseptics or uh, and antimicrobial agents, in addition to all the other supportive therapies. Again, I'm drawing attention <clears throat> to the Ansborg debridement document. I think it's still available online. 
if uh, if you cannot find the document, I'm sure Troy can put it in the chat line um, so you can have access to that. So <clears throat> I think we have asked you this question already. What is the most common method of debridement in your clinical practice? I think uh, before we do anything, whether you want to use autolytic or enzymatic or other type of debridement method, always think about some of the key questions when you're approaching your patients with wounds, the potential for wound healing. If the wounds cannot close and there are too much comorbidities and other factors that can impede wound healing process, perhaps your goal is to maintain the wound. Rather than creating a deeper, bigger wound, perhaps we can just preserve the area and keep it nice and dry to prevent secondary infection from happening. It also depends on the amount of necrotic tissue and the speed at which that you need to remove the necrotic tissue to promote better wound healing and reduce the risk of infection. And we also have to think about pain. Um, yes, there are different ways of managing pain, topical antiseptic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, topical anesthetics and other agents that we can use. But still, um, there's certain method that can be more painful and more non-selective than others. And definitely think about the risk of bleeding if you're using a sharp instrument, the risk for infection, and how bacteria can be introduced into deeper compartment, skill and expertise, whether it's within the scope of practice or not, and also the availability of resources. Not just about whether you have the scalpel in your hand that you can cut into the tissue or not, also think about the monitoring parameters, especially uh, my rule of thumb is I don't do debridement on a Friday afternoon. Be why? Because if someone uh, bled after I, I left the, the hospital, after I left the clinic, there's no one there to, to help monitor and, and address the problem. So I don't want any significant problem happening after hours. So especially if there's a, a weekend in between in between my working days. So um, I, I put a slide up because I think the first type of debridement I want to talk about is the autolytic debridement. And the purpose of this methodology is to keep the area moist to leverage on the endogenous uh, enzymes that are produced by our white blood cells immune system that can digest the non-viable tissue on the wound bed. Of course, needless to say, this method is slightly longer and depends on the immune system, the competency, whether the patient is on immunosuppressive drugs or drugs that can suppress the inflammatory response, then they may not be able to facilitate this type of autolytic deployment very well. And certain type of dressing, because of the intrinsic property of the dressing, Either they have this, what we call the capillary action, able to suck the fluid and wick the fluid along with the fluid, the necrotic non viable tissue into dressing itself to promote better autolytic debridement. Or the other mechanism is like honey dressing by osmosis, the high concentration material um, um, draw the fluid to the surface to hydrate the uh, necrotic tissue so it can slough off from the wound bed more easily. So that's the whole idea of using honey dressing. In fact, when you look at the Cochrane review in terms of um, utility of, of honey dressing, yes, it may be able to promote wound healing, but the, uh, the recommendation and the more impressive property of honey dressing is the ability to dislove fibrinous wound. Wounds that have this sort of very firm yellow wound base, and it's not so easy to remove like the stringy, uh, soft, slimy, sloughy, yellowish material. So that's utility for different types of dressing for different purposes. <clears throat> so moving on from autolytic to mechanical debridement, I would consider wound cleansing is one type of mechanical debridement. And I love this little picture here that uh, using a small little squeeze um, uh, uh, bottle with a few drops of saline is not really considered much of a, um, a irrigation, not to talk about, not to mention about as a method for debridement. So in order to facilitate irrigation as a mechanical debridement, debridement method, we have to ensure that there is enough force. 
And the recommendation is four to 15 pounds per square inch of force in order to help remove debris for material from the wind bed. And to facilitate this process, and there's been a lot of a plethora of, of cleansing agents available to us, for example, the use of surfactant that has the hydrophobic tail and the um, hydrophilic head. And what happened is when they were uh, stuck together, they literally repel from each other uh, as they enter into whether it's the biofilm environment or in the non-viable tissue environment. And they literally facilitate lifting of those non-viable material or, or biofilm away from the wound bed. So we can, uh, with the appropriate irrigation or mechanical deployment method, we can remove the non-viable tissue more easily. And I, I also had some um, experience of using uh, mechanical pads, uh, debridement pads that we can use to remove some of the slimy gelatinous material on the wound bed. Some of those material, they're slightly more expensive. And in fact, um, there's some study indicating that some of the um, gauze material potentially can also uh, function the, with the same for the same purpose. The only difference is with the gauze material, it may induce more trauma and more pain. And the second thing is with gauze material, uh, it tends to get saturated more faster, more quickly. So if you if your intention is to remove biofilm and the bacterial burden from the wind bed, you might have to change the, the gauze material more, more frequently. So alternatively, that's why other companies have produced uh, monofilament pads and uh, fiber, uh, the pads with fibers, so we can pick up all this non-viable tissue. And uh, this is just a, a little uh, video to show you that uh, uh, I'm, I was using this monofilament pad to clean off the area that uh, under the fluorescence imaging device, I'm assuming that there's a lot of bacteria sitting in this area. That's why I was paying a little bit more attention and spending more time to do some vigorous cleansing on this area. And uh, this patient does have neuropathy. So I was, um, I was quite uh, enthusiastic with my cleaning method to get, as you can see. But, uh, the outcome is quite um, quite amazing. After the cleansing, you can see the under the fluorescence light, the area that was lighting up no longer uh, was no longer there. So I think we're able to remove a significant amount of bacterial burden and also some of the vitalized tissue. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the most traditional way of looking at mechanical debridement is your wet to dry method, using a wet gauze applied to the wound wait for about 24 hours, come back, and you yank the dressing out, so wet to dry. When the dressing is dry, it will stick to the non-viable tissue or the slough, and as you um, remove the material with force, you, you're able to um, detect the, detach the material away from the wound bed. Um, there's no doubt, this is very barbaric, this is very old-fashioned, and it can cause trauma and pain. Um, that's why there's other alternative for us to think about, along with um, the irrigation method, along with the monofilament pad. The more advanced technology available to us is the ultrasonic method. I usually consider it as kind of the mechanical method as well. Uh, basically, this type of technology uh, utilizes low frequency ultrasound. They're able to emit the uh, the ultrasound traveling through, through the, the fluid into the wound bed, deliver it into the tissue and break down the, uh, the biofilm and also the non-viable tissue more effectively. Alternatively, there's also a hydrosurgical deployment method. Um, of course, this is a little more expensive and you do need to change the, the head from time to time and uh, the replacement could be quite costly. But you know, if you're dealing with a lot of necrotic tissue, and this is a very, very useful, um, similar to surgical, but not exactly a surgical deployment method, because the idea is they're able to generate uh, very high speed fluid that is traveling to the wound bed, and is able to sever the, the necrotic tissue away from the wound bed. <clears throat> and um, there's some off-label discussion about, well, with 
the use of negative pressure wind therapy, it may also be considered as a form of, of mechanical or promoting autolytic brimen, especially for negative pressure wind therapy to have this insulation th uh, capacity, allowing the fluid to dwell on the on the wound environment and before they apply the negative suction to the wound bed. So this a uh, again the fluid is able to pick up and all the all the devitalized tissue, bio burden, sloppy material is going to travel along with the fluid into the dressing, into the canister where you're applying your negative pressure wind therapy. Biological, um, I don't think we use a lot of biological uh, with intention, uh, just because we don't really have good access to this type of debridement method. Those type of larvas and maggots need to be grown in a sterile environment from a legal perspective. And the, uh, the maggots, usually from the Lucilia sericata uh, larva, able to produce a trypsin, chymotrypsin enzyme that can digest, digest, digest the protein in the wound environment. So it's a very, in fact, a very effective way to destroy biofilm and also to help facilitate removal of non-viable tissue. Um, at the moment, I don't believe that we have a lot of labs established to produce lava that we can use um, in clinical practice. Um, so accessibility is an issue. And if you look at some of the newer documents around um, debridement and also cleansing methods and cleansing agents, and there's one recent document published by the International Surgical Group with uh, Professor Harry Krishner being the chair, and they start introducing a term, what they call oxidative debridement. And also people have talked about use of chemical agents, chemical debridement. And this is slightly different compared to enzymatic debridement that we'll be spending more time later on. So this type of method using perhaps potent oxidizing agent, they're able to uh, maybe slightly more corrosive, able to uh, lift the material off from the wound bed and liquefy the necrotic tissue or soft sloppy tissue on the wound bed. And usually some of the studies also indicate the effectiveness of this type of oxidizing agent. We recommend the use of soaking or using uh, the chemical agent as a compress on top of the wound uh, because um, the longer time that the um, tissue is in exposure to the oxidating, oxidizing agent, the more effective it is in terms of removing the sloughy material. So there is the, this time dependent, dose dependent outcome that we can see. Um, definitely sharp debridement is the more straightforward, fast, effective way. Keep in mind about the healability, keep in mind about the circumstances that we may not want to do sharp debridement because of bleeding tendency and other risk for infection. So with sharp debridement, we usually use uh, sharp instruments. So in this case, um, what we use is there are a variety of instruments available for us. Um, you can use forceps, you can use uh, a scalpel, and one of my favorite tool is, of course, a curette. Uh, love, love, love curette if you can have access to it. So <clears throat> what a curette can do is um, if you open the package here. So you can see that it's, it's like a, a little spoon material. And one side is very, very sharp. The other side is dull. So how do you know which side is up and which side is down? And in this case, this type of, uh, this company produced this curette with this kind of, um, what do you call this? A uh, little pattern, little um, texture here on top. And that's, you should uh, put the this side on top versus other sides have no pattern on it. So <clears throat> here I, in front of me, I have a few of my favorite uh, fruits. <laughs> Guess what they are, right? This is a mango, this is a guava, mm, smells nice, and, uh, and banana. 
So um, let's start with a poor mango here. So you use your curette and you can actually uh, hold it like a pencil, uh, not like this. Uh, whether you're holding a scalpel or a curette, uh, my preference is always hold your instrument like a pencil and you can actually rest your wrist on a surface, whether it is on the person's um, skin or on a um, bedside table. This way, you don't get fatigued so easily and quickly. I've seen people doing debridement and they do doing this. Um, that's, you can get fatigued very easily. Well, you may not be able to see my hand arm here. So doing this, right? So you get fatigued very, very quickly. So that's why it's so much easier if you have a you if you can position and and set up the right way <clears throat> to make sure you have a surface to rest your wrist around and this way also what i find quite helpful is give you a lot of range of motion uh versus um you're not doing a you're not uh julia child doing a um, a cooking show so you don't do it like this because it's very very limited range of motion, you know, chopping directly into the tissue. Um, so you're basically, sometimes you're doing your shaving, sometimes you're just doing a little bit of the superficial saucerization of the wound edges. So that's why this is a much yeah, better way um, of, of protecting yourself and protecting your patient at the same time. So coming back to my poor mango. So if I'm using a, a blade, what I usually do is I like to start with a very, very low angle. And let's see if there's a little blemish over here that I want to shave that off. Then I sort of gradually, uh, very, uh, and of course, I should be wearing gloves in this case, but I forgot to bring my gloves with me for this evening. And at a very, very shallow angle, remember holding it like a pencil. And you can see that I'm actually resting my uh, fingers, my wrists on a surface to give me the stability. Otherwise, if you're holding your, your instrument in the air, it's not so good. So I'll try not to cut myself because otherwise it would be quite embarrassing to be bleeding in front of everyone joining us tonight and I have to go to emergency. I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, uh, of all the years I've been doing debridement, I've never... Um, injured myself in any significant way. Uh, exactly. Eh? So anyway, um, coming back to this uh, deployment and I'm uh, shaving that off. And you don't always have to uh, do it in one cut. You can gradually kind of doing a little shaving uh, kind of thing and gradually a little bit of time. So you can see that, uh, oh, lo and behold, this uh, blemish is actually deeper than I thought then I will continue to shave it down like this. So the danger is you don't want to be doing this sort of perpendicular at a very sharp angle. The sharper the angle, the more deeper you can penetrate into the tissue and the more likely it can cause bleeding. Unless you're really, really sure that there is, uh, that this layer of, of necrotic tissue is quite thick and there's no really significant blood supply there. And which is a good point that before I do my debridement, I usually try to palpate the surrounding area <clears throat> for a number of good reasons. One is I want to see, I want to feel the texture around the, the, the wound. Uh, is there any fluctuance, any bogginess? When there is something boggy and there's fluctuance, meaning that sort of a, almost feel like there's some buoyancy going on underneath the skin, indicating perhaps that there's an abscess, there's a collection of wound fluid that I need to uh, perhaps evacuate or expect to see, that I might want to make sure that I cut into those areas. The other thing is, as I palpate, I can actually estimate the area that I might need to, uh, to debride. So a good indication is, there's a difference between dead tissue and good tissue. If you feel your own hand, uh, good tissue, it's bouncy, nice and soft, and, uh, and got this sort of good tensile strength, and, um, it, and it's nicely hydrated, I think it is anyway, versus when tissue is, is damaged, dead tissue, it will become more indurated, there may be scarring involved. 
So when you palpating it, you can actually feel the edge of the damaged tissue. Uh, give you a little bit rough idea in terms of um, the extent of tissue damage. Not necessarily saying that you need to be cutting to all the the indurated area, because especially where you have the necrotic tissue meeting the healthy tissue, that margin is extremely dangerous when you're cutting into it because you, unless you have, you know, perfusion scan in your eyes, you have no idea where that margin is, where that edge is, where the capillaries are. So that's why you don't want to be cutting too close to that margin. So you want to cut directly as much uh, non-fibrous tissue. Again, I'm coming back to shave off, shave off this flamish so I can enjoy this mango after my talk. But I think this is not quite ripe enough yet. So you can see that uh, using a very, very low angle, I use my hand to stabilize my blade and instead of flying around like this. So I want to make sure that I have uh, removed all the unwanted material from the surface. Now, as I said, the sharper angle you, you, you take, the deeper uh, your cut is going to be. So be careful about the angle. And also it depends on the type of blade. Uh, of course, we never do this in clinical practice, touching the blade. But in this case, um, just want to show you the blade surface. Yeah, you can see that there is um, the sharp edges go from the tip all the way down to the end. So sometimes people, uh, I've seen people, sometimes they hold a blade like this. Ooh, ooh, you're going to cut yourself because there's a sharp edge over here. So just be careful when you're examining the type of instrument that you're using. All right, <clears throat> so the same as using a curette. Uh, as I said, this is one of my favorite tool for uh, removing necrotic tissue. And you can see that uh, there's a, like a spoon, you can scoop out the non-viable tissue. And again, same technique, holding it like a pencil find your surface and to stabilize your wrist and the instrument that you're holding. And you can start scraping. And usually um, it's give me a little bit more control. I think it's maybe a preference. I like to scrape it towards myself versus scraping away. It gives me a little more control when I'm scraping it towards me a little bit. Uh, and perhaps it, it is a preference, uh, but I, when I teach people how to do deployment, I usually tell them to scrape it towards your body because that way uh, uh, is actually um, give you a little more control and less likely to fatigue again. And the same as the blade, when you're holding your blade, you don't shave it like this because you have no idea what you're shaving at when the blade is going away from your eyes versus this way that I can see exactly what I'm cutting and how far I should be cutting and stop where I don't want to be cutting into the viable tissue or skin. Isn't that fun? Oh, what a mess I'm making here. Um, anyway, so uh, similar to um, uh, some of the soft tissue, in this case, I have a banana in front of me, um, and you can also um, use your blade if you're trying to remove, uh, oh, this is such a lovely banana, no blemish going on here. Uh, <laughs> um, and if you're trying to remove some of the material here, this is not vi non viable tissue, but there's a little bit something there I want to remove. So again, you in this case, if I my intention is use a forcep to stabilize and to pick up the tissue, that you want to um, uh, facilitate the removal. And so I can pinch the areas lightly where you have the necrotic tissue, again, using a very low angle and start shaving it like this. As I shave it, and uh, you can actually have a little more edge that allow your forcep to pick up this, this lifted area to look for the base of this um, of this non piece of non viable tissue, then it actually helps to remove the tissue more effectively. 
And actually, let me just show you this a little bit better. So um, if you're, so again, holding a forcep, I like to hold it like this, not like this, because it doesn't give me a lot of range and I can get fatigued very quickly. I can hold it like a pencil, resting my wrist on the surface, uh, pinching the area up uh, where you want to do the debridement, right? And then gradually, gingerly, carefully, shave it. Okay, no bleeding. I'm good to go further. No bleeding. You see, I'm lifting it up as I go. And the idea is I'm trying to get to the wound bed as close to the base as possible to do a thorough debridement, right? So you can hopefully see that nicely on the on the screen there. Okay, so that's sharp debridement and sort of a few things that uh, that I've learned along the way. Now, of course, <clears throat> we always have to anticipate the uh, risk for um, for bleeding. Sorry, I'm cleaning up my table so it doesn't get too much stains everywhere. So if there is um, any bleeding problem, and um, there are a couple of things uh, that you can do, um, and uh, one of the major um, ingredient that you can actually stop the bleeding is, um, for example, let me just show you here, um, Surgicel, um, which is a collagen dressing that has a uh, hemostatic property. This is very, very expensive. So uh, most of the institution would not have this available anywhere, but this is extremely effective for a actively bleeding wound. Um, for more minor type of bleeding, you can either use a calcium alginate or you can use a um, uh, uh, like a Caltrostat type material with hemostatic property with calcium alginate. So in order to use some of those in uh, material, make sure you apply a lot of pressure locally. So I'm just, just trying to find a four by four. And unfortunately, it's nothing within my reach at this point. So trust me um, that I'll uh, apply a four by four. Um, if the areas is bleeding uh, with a very um, localized pressure where the bleeding is for about 10 to 15 minutes, remember, don't leave your finger away. Every time you lift your finger, the clot that's being disturbed will bleed again. So keep your finger there for about five to 10 minutes. I would say even 10 to 15 minutes to be safe. Yeah, I know it's it's a very long time. It seems like eternity, if, especially if the patient is bleeding in front of you. <clears throat> but um, usually most of the minor bleeding would stop within that time, 10 to 15 minutes. Just be patient and don't lift your finger away. <clears throat> and uh, in some serious situation, of course, uh, if the bleeding is not stopped, then uh, you probably need to call for help, help. And uh, and uh, in some situations um, that I've dealt before, then I need to put a suture um, to close the, um, the, the capillary where it's been cut. Um, as I said, the, hopefully in most cases, you are able to stop the bleeding with the pressure or also with the um, surgery, uh, surgery cell type material. Um, and some of the minor bleeding, um, actually uh, sort of smaller cut and very, very minor cut, some of the um, acrylate material, uh, we use the term skin, uh, um, skin bandaid, uh, may be able to, a second skin may be able to help to stop the bleeding. One of my favorite is, um, is using a, um, a sun acrylate material and you can actually break the vial in the middle and then activating the chemical um, reaction inside the vial. And now you can actually see the um, the applicator turning into, oops, blue color. Don't know where I'm going. Here we go. Blue color and um, and then apply to the uh, area there where there is a cut. 
I, I, I use this app actually quite often on my skin because in the winter time, particularly, I got uh, hand dermatitis from washing too much. Then I got cracks and fissures on my fingers. And this is such a nice way just to seal off all the material. Uh, so the blue material is called cyanoacrylate. Um, so it's a very similar ingredient to a lot of acrylate, but cyano is just um, an added ingredient that make it uh, work faster. And you can actually see the blue color there. All right. Um, yeah, so that's a few things that I want to show you about um, shop debridement. I'm sure there's uh, more questions. As I said, you know, this is not really a, <laughs> a workshop for debridement. Uh, uh, but I thought that it's kind of fun for me to do a few demo here. Okay, going back to uh, my presentation, which I've closed. Um, sorry, let me just uh, give me one second to get things set up again. Uh, yeah, keep the questions coming and uh, we'll try to entertain your question as much as we can. Um, and it's nice to see such an interactive group. So I'm gonna close this camera so you won't be seeing my table again. And I'm going to share my screen and come back to the idea of sharp debridement. Um, so yeah, this is a real deal, looking at real patient and you can use a blunt instrument and you can just wipe off and using a little bit more force to remove the non-viable tissue. You can see those, um, um, well, first of all, those type of material, they don't they don't have blood in them. So you know they're, they're non-viable. And also um, they represent some kind of a proteinaceous, maybe dried up extra day that's stuck to the wound bed that need to be removed because otherwise it will just perpetuate this inflammatory response. You can also use a forcep to scrape some of the more stubborn, tenacious, fibrinous material from the wound. And you can see that in this case, I'm using a curette to remove the material. So yeah, um, uh, curette, uh, curetting and I, well, using a shaving technique, very uh, useful to remove some of the hyperkeratotic skin around um, neuropathic foot ulcers because uh, a lot of times we see buildup of callus. And remember, all this thick skin is not innocuous. They actually can increase the amount of peak plantar pressure quite significantly. It's like every step they're, they're, they're putting on uh, the foot on the ground is like stepping on a, on a piece of stone. So this type of pressure can cause a lot of damage to the subcutaneous tissue. And that's why in this case, you can see some subcutaneous bleeding going on below the uh, below the callus. Uh, more aggressive uh, type of debridement method that can potentially cause more bleeding, but uh, so in some cases it may be necessary to remove the hyperkeratotic edge where the keratinocytes come from. They come from the hair follicles from the wound edge. So if your wound edges are raised and unhealthy, and full of senescent cells, we might want to shake things up a little bit by doing this sharp debridement. And you can see that uh, by removing the unhealthy hyperkeratosis, now you can actually facilitate a slope that allow keratinocytes to move directly into the wound bed for healing purposes. And in some cases, uh, we might even just uh, try to remove as much bony fragments and bony tissue that is on the wound bed. Because whenever there's bone exposure, you know those bones are damaged uh, in chronic wounds. So we need to uh, be very um, aggressive with some of the um, debridement uh, in some cases. Um, and I wanna show you this slide because uh, sharp debridement uh, for very aggressive sharp debridement. In some cases, it may involve uh, more aggressive um, evacuation. In this case, you can see this uh, plantar foot ulcer. In fact, the two openings are communicating with each other 
and I was just pondering whether I want to cut into the skin area to remove this bridge because it's not really serving any purposes. In some, in some cases, it may actually make it more difficult for people to pack into the wound environment. So there's a certain situation that we might we may consider to remove some of the viable tissue in order to facilitate the routine care. And in this case, you can see that uh, some of the, especially pressure injuries, that the opening can become so small and you still have a big crevice inside the wound with a stage four pressure injury. Um, so in my practice, I might, at some stage, I might consider uh, opening up the opening to uh, uh, to allow healing from the wound bed, from the wound, from the base. Uh, otherwise, if the if there's premature closure of the wound, then you create an environment where abscess can form and creating um, other problems with sepsis. <clears throat> so we can see that this wound seems so small, and we uh, we we pack this wound with all kinds of material. And you can appreciate how much drainage is coming out from this wound. So. I would say the drainage is not expected, the amount of drainage is disproportional to the wound. So you know that there is a lot of, of space inside a big crevice. So we need to monitor this very, very carefully. Uh, at some stage, definitely we might want to open this up. You can see there's a little dimple going on there and that's the cue that perhaps there is a space. So there's no tissue to support the roof of, of, this, uh, of this flap of skin. Um, what about other type of non-viable tissue? Um, yeah, so that's why um, as ends work, uh, you do need to know your anatomy and know what you're looking at and digging at in the wound. In this case, this individual with, uh, with gout <clears throat> and, um, and uh, in another patient, uh, this patient actually have um, cutaneous TB. So there's a lot of cheesy uh, calcium-like uh, material. So this is uh, with the gout situation, um, each nodule is full of those calcium deposits. We call them tophies. And they're basically um, uh, non-viable tissue, unhealthy tissue that is not desirable in a, in a, in a, in a compartment, in the dermal compartment. So sometimes when there's such a, a buildup of tophi, it will burst open and creating a wound, a wound, a lesion. In those cases, then uh, if it's open, I would like to extract as much calcium tophi as possible. Remember, those are not desirable. They're foreign material. They're gonna perpetuate this inflammatory response. And keep in mind that potentially could be painful, especially with gout, of course, it will be quite inflammatory, quite inflamed. And also with, um, with caseous necrosis, in, in this case of uh, TB, cutaneous TB, again, all this tissue is, is turned into cheesy material. And that's why we call this caseous necrosis. And yeah, we need to be aggressively dig into the area in order to facilitate wound healing. And um, in, my, in, in the past, a lot of times we even just send out some of those cases, necrosis uh, to the lab to evaluate the bacterial burden to see how much uh, tuberculosis bacteria is actually in the tissue to determine the effectiveness of treatment. Um, but there are situations that we should not consider shock deprivement at all. A lot of best practice recommendation guidelines <clears throat> are telling us that if you're dealing with stable ashgar, stable leathery dead material on the heel area, stable meaning there's no blotment, there's no fluctuance, there's uh, no crepitus, um, and it's just there, hard, dry, nothing expressible, then don't touch it. And just a reminder that when you're writing your recommendation, making sure that people are not rehydrating it, patients should not be going to shower without any protection. People should not be applying saline or sterile water that can rehydrate those necrotic tissue. Uh, so any gel, any type of occlusive material should be avoided in this case. So best practice is 
use antiseptic agent. In this case, you can see the stain left behind with the povidone iodine in order to keep the area nice and dry. Now, what are we looking at? Do you want to debride this wound? Do you want to debride this wound? I hope your answer is a no, uh, not necessarily. In this case, uh, we, we look closer. Yes, they look kind of unhealthy looking, but they're very, very close to tendon. <clears throat> this is a tough call because the tendon is not extremely healthy looking. You can see this turn into this grayish color. Um, and But my practice, I, I, I try to be more cautious and be more careful. Um, I would just try to keep the tendon for as long as possible until there's very, very clear indication that it's no longer attached to, to anything, right? So yeah, in this case, this is a very, very healthy tendon that should not be cut and should not be damaged, should not be, should not receive any sharp manipulation, in other words, right? Um, and I want to emphasize this because there are people who thought that, well, everything yellow in the wound should be removed with sharp debridement. And so they go ahead and cutting everything. Um, and when you cut into tendons, you actually damage the tissue and you compromise the ability for joint movement. Um, and patient may become permanently paralyzed um, from um, damaging their tendons. So anyway, I think we can uh, sort of appreciate the the um, the um, enormity of some of those um, wrong decisions that we make. That's why that's why I want to emphasize that. Now, what about this one? <clears throat> Is a surgical wound, and there are, um, some sloppy tissue going on, unhealthy, perhaps it's even sort of gaping open with this dehiscence. Would you debride? Now, this is a tough call as well. So that's why, you know, it's kind of fun to have this dialogue and, and talk about this. Um, in this case, I might want to keep the um, staples for longer duration of time because uh, if I don't think there's a big crevice inside, I want to keep the skin as approximated as possible for longer duration of time. Now, if this has evolved into a deeper space, more open, more fluid, and I might want to um, uh, remove a lot of staples to make sure the fluid is able to evacuate more effectively, and I might, might want to perform more aggressive sharp debridement to remove all this non viable tissue, creating a space where you can put into your packing material to wick away the fluid, and also to occupy the space to allow secondary healing, uh, the healing with secondary intention. So you can see the decision that the, the, the kind of algorithm involved in my decision-making processes, all the different factors. What do I want to do with this wound? What's the purpose of what I'm doing? Do I want to keep it longer with the staples because I think it's going to close versus I want to remove the staples, remove all the necrotic tissue so I can pack it more effectively. So it's all based on your clinical assessment. What about this? <clears throat> um, there's a lot of debate whether blisters should be popped, deroofed, drained, incised. Um, then again, there's no one correct answer. Um, and I put these two pictures up because you can appreciate, oh, I'm trying to watch my time. I'm really uh, behind. Um, in this case, you can see that uh, there were quite big blisters and they on, on areas that may not always be stable. So in this case, if the patient is walking, I want to make sure that I, I drain the blister. Otherwise, it may pop in the most uh, unhygienic environment, dirty environment. And so I want to make sure that it's being drained and removed, the fluid being removed in a more controlled space. Uh, hypergranulation tissue, I just don't want to spend too much time given that I'm quite late already. Um, and yes, you might want to remove them and promote the edge effect because if you have a lot of hypergranulation tissue, uh, keratinocytes may not be able to travel to the top of the of this mountain to promote epithelialization. And also keep in mind that not all not all hypergranulated area should be touched. 
In this case, this is cancer related material. So a lot of times you can easily use a silver nitrate stick. In this case, I'm um, applying some pressure, making sure the silver nitrate is penetrating into the hypergranulated material to ensure that I'm, I'm uh, applying the chemical agent to burn off the unhealthy, undesirable tissue. And yes, potentially it could be quite painful. So uh, along the, the discussion of debridement, making sure you look at pear wound skin, uh, manage the hyperkeratosis. Again, using the pad, uh, we have uh, just to show you the importance of removing all this hyperkeratosis. That's where all the fungus bacteria are hiding if we want to promote better wound hygiene and skin hygiene. Uh, enzymatic debridement. Quickly, in five minutes. You, you can uh, take your time there, Kevin. If you have time, we have time for you as well. Okay, excellent. I'll take another two hours. Um, enzymatic debridement. And uh, I like some people's terminology. Uh, using sharp debridement, we may consider as a macro debridement method because you're using a blade, cutting into the skin, chunks of tissue will come out. Versus um, enzymatic debridement, may consider as a micro debridement or a, a ongoing maintenance debridement because those enzymes is able to remove material at a more uh, microscopic level that yes, the blade, the scalpels may not be able to pick that up very easily because they're so small, they're so scattered around the wound bed. Um, in fact, when you look at the, the literature, there are different types of material out there. There's a new company promoting bromelain based. If you know uh, what bromelain is, it's basically what you see here, pineapple. It potentially could be quite, uh, uh, have produced burning sensation with bromelain. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about uh, some of the studies. Pepain, uh, it's uh, also extract enzyme from papaya. Uh, I've been to Brazil a few times and uh, they papain is papaya is extremely popular. They they don't use the commercial based product because of the cost perspective. And they actually they taught me to shave the papaya and and the green papaya particularly, and they put the papaya flesh into the wound. Um, and the enzyme will be released from the flesh in the wound to promote um, enzymatic debridement. Um, interesting, but uh, yeah, I think there were some studies being done in Brazil right now to, to evaluate the effectiveness of papaya. I'm not saying that we should all picking up our fruit and start putting into a patient's wounds, um, <laughs> God forbid. Uh, but I think you know there's just a lot of interesting chemical agents available. And um, uh, collagenase. Collagenase is actually the only approved enzymatic agents available in Canada at the moment. Um, if you're curious about the effectiveness of collagenase in wounds, this is a nice systematic review done by Virginie Blanchette and uh, Jeremy Petri, I think. I know Virginie because uh, we're in the same uh, best practice panel. She's a uh, podiatrist, uh, has been done, doing a lot of research and doing her PhD in Quebec as well. Uh, wonderful person to, to work with. But anyway, uh, they looked at all the different studies, 22 studies in total, and confirmed that enzymatic debridement using collagenase is quite effective in the management of foot ulcers and other type of ulcers. So what is collagenase really? Um, it is, um, you can see that it's in a tube. Um, based, uh, the, the vehicle, the backbone is white petroleum and what's inside uh, basically some enzymatic agent as the name implies, those clostridium collagenases are produced by the clostridium bacteria, type bacteria. They produce two distinct types of collagenases, the collagenase, collagenase G and the collagenase H. So why is it so important for me to go through the, the number of different ingredients? Well, the interesting thing is the, the different types of collagenases, they're able 
to interact with different parts of the collagen. And this is a nice little diagram to show the collagen is, is weaved, braided in this trihelical structure. So what the collagenase is able to do is to unwind and destroy the bonds between the, the strands that hold the collagen together and break it down into different components, releasing those byproducts that actually may have a role to play to facilitate wound healing, stimulating fibroblastic activities, promoting endothelial cells growth, and also facilitating the keratinocytes movement. And that's why uh, we love to use collagen dressing to promote wound healing, right? So now what the, um, what the enzyme is able to do to release the good uh, form of, of collagen to facilitate the wound healing. And we'll come back to talk more about that. So the collagenase is superior to the endogenous collagenase in a way that what we produce, the cell uh, produced collagenase is, a, is only able to attach to one area on the collagen structure versus the three different types of collagens or the collagenases will be able to attach to seven different areas. So how to use collagenase? Well, <clears throat> you find a wound that has slough necrotic tissue, you apply the collagenase, uh, the thin layer would do. And if you have a space with a depth, you can put gauze or other type of dressing material on top. You don't want to use material with any silver to mix with collagenase. You don't want to mix with any type of metal or very oxidative agent. So what the what you see on the video here is the enzyme would penetrate into the tissue and finding the area that they want to attach to the collagen structure, and then it can cut the um, the uh, non-viable tissue from the wound bed, and it would not damage the intact protein the intact collagen, because configuration of the, the damaged collagen, what we call denatured protein, look, look very different compared to healthy collagen. And because of the architecture of the damaged collagen, that's how the collagenases will be able to recognize where they're supposed to go. So this is another nice little science um, slide um, to tell you for this evening is that uh, with the collagenase, it's able, another function, interesting function, and the more I read about this, the more fascinating it is, uh, it's able to promote the, uh, trans the conversion of M1, the type one macrophage, to the M2, the type two macrophages. And the two different types of macrophages have opposite activities. M1, they're considered to be pro-inflammatory, versus M2, the anti-inflammatory with the production of different types of cytokines. So in this video, you can see that in the wound with the use of um, uh, central collagenase, um, and initially there's the M1, a lot of those pro-inflammatory, remember different phases of wound healing. The function of those macrophages is basically trying to rebuild, so it's trying to re like rebuilding the house, resetting, the function of the wound environment, cleaning that off, more stimulating inflammatory cells versus M2 is to recruit all the new cells to the area to promote better wound healing. So um, there's been some of the, the bench studies indicating that collagenase would be able to play this role to facilitate because of the product they released, the end product they, they, they produce. Uh, with the interaction of denatured collagen, able to convert the M1 to M2 from the pro-inflammatory environment to the anti-inflammatory environment that can facilitate better wound healing in this case. So yeah, so with this sort of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory with all the uh, uh, reparative collagen that is laid out in the wound bed, it facilitate fibroblast movement, facilitate endothelial cells growth, and also keratinocytes movement as well. 
some of these studies that have been done, you can see that there is um, increase in phyroblastic migration with the use of, uh, of uh, collagenase and producing those healthy, good collagen fragments from the denatured protein. And also the collagen fragments um, from the collagen release from the collagenases able to uh, facilitate angiogenesis, promote endothelial cells growth, um, and definitely eventually facilitate keratinocytes to close up the wound uh, with full epithelialization. Yeah, so usually the recommendation is to apply enzymatic agent daily, and it may be able to uh, promote better wound healing. And a lot of times you can combine them with the sharp debridement uh, because you may not be able to see patients every day to promote debride, sharp debridement. So the substance, just a reminder that when you're using enzymatic agent, they're more stable in a pH level between 6.8 to 7.4. So you don't want to make it too acidic in the environment or too alkaline in the environment. Uh, it can be affected by surfactant, detergent type material, heavy metals because of the metal proteinases, the collagenase. Uh, so you don't want to uh, have a lot of metals that can inactivate the, the, the enzyme. Like mercury, zinc, silver should be avoided. It should not be used in combination with povid iodine and antiseptic solution. Well, other solutions, perhaps, uh, even though we don't think they're bad, very good choices, we don't use hydrogen peroxide, we should not be using Dakin solution, uh, but sodium chloride is fine. So just a couple of cases, you can see that this patient with a wound full of uh, sloppy tissue applying the center collagenase. Um, what the, the point I'm trying to, sh to show you here is the, the edge effect with collagenase. Um, and uh, it's been documented in some of the case studies that uh, with the appropriate use of collagenase, the epithelialization, the keratinocyte movement, uh, allow the, the resolution of uh, 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 the epipoli. So what it is, is that, that the lip, the edge, the margin at the wound edge looks raised in this picture here. With the use of collagenate, we're able to change the shape of this raised edge. And now the keratinocytes, again, will be able to migrate to the wound bed more quickly, more easily. And you can see the outcome with the continuous use of collagenase. Look at this nasty wound cooked full of clot. Yeah, and we perform sharp debridement, clean up the wound. And we also use some other dressing to promote autolytic debridement. And now you can see all this micro small areas that need to be addressed. Um, so we use the center collagenase and able to clean up the wound bed. So I do apologize for a little over time, and uh, I hope that this is a uh, interesting talk. I have lots of fun playing with my fruit. Uh, thank you for for being here, and I'm sure that there may be a couple minutes for questions, perhaps. Absolutely, and and don't apologize. This was fantastic education, and thank you for the demonstrations as well. I know it's been very appreciated by the attendees we have here. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few questions here, and I've sort of grouped them a little bit, so we'll see how many we can get to. Um, and maybe what we'll do in the background here is as we answer the questions, what I'll do is I'll launch our last poll. So as you're hearing some of these questions and in considering what you've learned today so far, uh, just answer, whoops, here we go, answer the poll you should see in front of you now, which is uh, about how confident you now feel after this session. So Kevin, uh, one of the first questions we have here, since we were talking about uh, Santal towards the end here, I might just uh, keep keep uh, ourselves going with that. Um, could you uh, uh, just mention whether the uh, Santal would be comfortable for patients with full feeling? Absolutely. I don't think there's been any documentation about uh, pain induced by the use of collagenase. It's very uh, innocuous. There's nothing really burned um, into the skin. So it's, it should not be painful at all. Fantastic. And then uh, on the same topic here, can we use Santal on a surgical wound and or diabetic wounds? Excellent question. You can use Santal on any different types of wound as long as you can see sloppy tissue or there's a need for debridement. And in fact, I, I didn't really touch on that uh, much on the presentation. Um, 
I believe that there may be some function. And in fact, there's one study, some recent study in 2024, looking, comparing different types of agents, including collagenate uh, in addressing biofilm. Uh, it's not a, a it's not study that directly studying biofilm, but they, they demonstrated that the collagenase may be able to facilitate or prevent biofilm from forming, perhaps because of some of the interaction and uh, interaction with the collagen that is required by the biofilm. I gotcha. And, I, and the, you may have covered this in that answer there, but this would also, uh, would it also be used on wounds with undermining? Um, absolutely. Um, absolutely. <laughs> um, so of course, uh, you, uh, why I'm hesitating is because uh, you want to make sure that you clean the area uh, thoroughly as well. So what I often do if if there's a lot of undermining and tunneling, I might impregnate my gauze and ribbon with the central collagenase and pack into the wound. Um, so you're not over applying your product into the wound environment because um, I'm I'm cheap um, and this is a very expensive product. I don't want to overuse it if there's no need for it. Fair enough. All right, we'll pivot over here to kind of the topic of biofilm a little bit. Um, so we've got a few on the same topic here. Uh, one is uh, asking about, uh, going back to the honey at the beginning that we were talking about, uh, does debridement with a honey dressing also address biofilm? And I think you mentioned this at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, it, it has not been extremely effective using honey against biofilm. Uh, the caveat with the honey is, because of the osmotic effect, remember is drawing fluid to the local environment with the intention to rehydrate desiccated dead material with the objective to liquefy the tissue so it can be disloved more easily. Now, with that, the increased amount of fluid can, uh, can cause maceration. And you might want to change the dressing more, more frequently to reduce the strike through and to manage the fluid. At the same time, um, it may not always the most effective way of managing biofilm. But if you're changing the dressing frequently, that may not be a big concern. If, as far as I know, there's not a lot of good studies demonstrating the effectiveness of honey against biofilm and biofilm formation. Gotcha. Now, talking a bit more about biofilm there, do you find that it's better uh, to use a curette, or when would it potentially be better to use a curette versus a scalpel to disrupt the biofilm? Um, <clears throat> with the curette, um, you can actually run through the surface. Uh, it depends how much force you apply to the wound, and that would determine the depth of, of penetration. Um, so if you have a wind bed and yes, it looks kind of with granulation tissue, but not a healthy kind of granulation tissue, and you want to disturb the wind bed, again, depends on your assessment and the, your objective, I might run the, the wind bed very gently with the curette and just try to disrupt. Versus with the blade, that doesn't really give me a lot of, um, it does, it's not that easy to be able to scrape the surface so um, without causing a lot of trauma, if that makes any sense. So in other words, I actually prefer curette if I'm doing something more superficial versus uh, the blade. But depends on the amount of tissue, depends the depth of the damage, and I might select a different type of tools. Fantastic. And, and now you were talking again, we talked about the, the different types of um, plants and fruits using there. One person was asking specifically about berberine. Is this something that you've heard of before? Um, it, apparently it helps with MRSA uh, biofilms specifically. Is this something that you've come across? Um, what is the term, sorry? Berberine, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E. -E. Uh, yeah. Um, um, again, the science, it's very, it's not that great. I think it's sort of keep it's just popping up once in a while and then it disappear again. Uh, I get, I guess, because there's a commercial um, interest around that. But uh, I, I, that's all I can say about it. I don't, I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. 
Okay, yeah, no, no problem at all. Uh, let, let's uh, move over a little bit to the topic of bleeding. Um, so one of the questions here is about use, the use of silver nitrate uh, uh, sticks to stop bleeding. Should you then deactivate silver nitrate after applying it? Or do you use silver nitrate sticks to, to stop bleeding to begin with? Uh, excellent question. So um, depends. <laughs> I know the famous answer is not um, if you uh, have silver nitrate left on the wound, it will continue to be active, uh, potentially. So it depends on how many things that there are proteinaceous material, fluid, that can inactivate the silver nitrate. That's why when people apply silver nitrate around G-tube site, around tracheostomy site, the warning is if you don't clean that properly, the silver nitrate can burn the tube. The silver nitrate can burn the plastic component of the tracheostomy tube, the external canister, or the the uh, the the uh, the external device. So, um, and that's why I'm saying it depends. So, if you have a bleeding area that you want uh, the more sort of prolonged, slightly more prolonged effect to stop the bleeding then yes, you might want to leave the silver nitrate for a little bit longer, like the one that I show you in the picture with the hypergranulated area around the nail bed. Um, I, I left it for a little bit longer because there's still some bleeding going on. And uh, versus if I'm doing a, around a uh, an area that, that is more vascular or there's some healthy material, some uh, equipment material, plastic material, then I definitely want to wash it off or a wound, I really want to wash it off. And then, so there's no uh, uh, prolonged effect that it's going to cause further damage when I leave the, uh, the, the patient's room. Fantastic, well, thanks for touching on that there. I know there was quite a few people who were asking about that. Um, another question is that if there is bleeding with surgical debridement, uh, is the re recommendation to apply pressure uh, for five to 15 minutes followed by a calcium alginate dressing? Uh, is it dressing first before pressure is uh, applied? How would you approach that sort of scenario? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's any uh, formally approach to what people have done. Uh, if you're concerned, uh, in, in, in most situations, uh, if you're applying pressure, uh, you should apply pressure with the gauze, with whatever it is. And uh, for minor bleeding, it will stop. I don't really need to worry too much about anything else because your body actually produced the local clotting mechanism close, not bleeding. If after you apply the pressure and there's still some concern about bleeding or re-bleeding or the patient has, is on anticoagulant or the clot is not very stable from your perspective, sure, apply the calcium alginate afterwards. So... Um, yeah, so I think the answer is depends on your patient, depends on your comfort level. I wouldn't say anything wrong if you use a calcium alginate every time after you your, your apply pressure. Um, it's always good to be on the cautious side in, from my perspective. So why not, right? If you have that available in front of you. Thank you for touching on that. I think we might, we'll go over to maybe one more question and then we'll bring, uh, finalize with a couple more about Santa because I know we've got quite a few that have come in since we started our Q&A period here. So uh, one question here is about someone who's working in the community. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult uh, for debriding difficult wounds, maybe don't have as many resources available to you. Um, what would be your recommendation to someone working in the community here? Um, any suggestions on where to, to send difficult debridement patients? What What's sort of the recommendation behind that? Oh gosh, uh, such an uh, interesting question. I, I think um, uh, the Answal community is it's where you should uh, uh, you should make some friends and, and making sure that you can draw on the expertise. And there's a wonderful Answal across the country, um, and I'm sure Troy, you can uh, point the direction for some directory where people can locate their the closest ends walk they can get. Um, and most ends walk should be quite comfortable with some form of deployment or make some recommendations about that. Absolutely. And maybe what we'll do is when we follow up uh, with our post webinar email here to everybody, we'll also, we'll, we'll bring in our, our uh, best recommend be best practice recommendations documents, and then maybe some directions on how to get in touch with an end swag. 
Um, let's, let's go and back. I think, uh, oh, yeah, go well, if I'm not incorrect, I think uh, there's also a capacity to just email you guys directly if there's any. Absolutely. Okay. Here, I'll throw our email in the chat here as well. Um, and yeah, we'd be absolutely happy, happy to direct you as well, no matter where you are in the, in the country. Um, so bringing it back to, to Santel here to, to close it off, uh, we had a few. One is asking about uh, what kind of topper is to be used on top of Santel to ensure it stays in the wound bed and isn't absorbed into a dressing, assuming that there's no foam. Um, yeah, I, I think any type of material would be fine as long as they don't have silver, they don't have iodine. Um, so you can use um, hydrofairy blue, you can use um, regular foam dressing, you can use gauze. Um, so it depends on the amount of fluid coming out from the wound. You match the, well, let me just go back, backtrack a little bit. When you're using collagenase, you expect to see a little more fluid. But the recommendation is to they do a daily application, daily dressing change anyway. So there may not always be a huge concern about absorbency. But if you, so you should always expect a little more fluid because all this dead tissue is supposed to be turning into um, dead, uh, sort of a more sloughy, easier to remove material being liquefied. And at the same time, it still may like, stimulate more fluid to the surface. So, uh, so I probably will err on something that's more absorbent um, and depends whether you have a packing space or not, something with high tensile strength. Um, so hopefully I kind of give you uh, some some tips and ideas about what type of, of secondary dressing to use. Fantastic. And I know that in the background here, uh, uh, Sub and Kim have been help, help, uh, helping answer some of the questions. So if you click on your Q&A tab, you can see some of the ones that have been uh, just uh, given a typed response there. Um, one more question here, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up today. Um, talking about what to do after uh, granulation has been achieved, would you what, what product would you apply once the Santal has, has already achieved debridement? We get some of that granulation now. <clears throat> Excellent question. So I think uh, I think my last webinar is still available, isn't it, Troy? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I would encourage you to perhaps go to that webinar. Uh, um, and, and I think it really depends on whether you're con you have any concerns about bacterial damage. So if there's no um, signs of infection and it's all nice and clean, some dressings that you can... So select your dressing based on the amount of fluid produced from the wound. If it's too dry, you want to donate moisture to promote moist wound healing environment. You can use gel, you can use something more occlusive. If there's a lot of fluid, use hydrofiber, gelling fiber, use uh, foam dressings, use um, calcium alginate to absorb the, the fluid into the wound in order to wick away fluid at the same time, keeping, keeping the wound moist, not wet, just the ideal amount of moisture. So if you're concerned about infection, a variety of things available to use, silver, iodine, so on and so forth. Perfect. All right. Well, I think we've uh, taken quite a bit of your time here. And we look, we really appreciate you going through everything today and staying on a little bit longer. Um, again, I'm just going to echo everyone's messages in here. Um, it was a fantastic uh, bit of education. And for anyone whose answer didn't get uh, didn't get hit, you can send uh, a question over to us at office at nswoc.ca. And we might be able to help direct you, um, whether it's to Smith & Nephew or uh, otherwise. You're going to be getting a survey in, uh, in your browser once this webinar ends, as well as uh, in a post-webinar email from Zoom. Uh, we encourage you to, to fill that out as well. It's going to help with uh, Smith & Nephew and help uh, inform us on the education to come in the future. Um, so again, thank you all for attending uh, uh, us today. Everyone who's on will be getting a certificate of attendance in the next couple of days, and we'll get the recording of this webinar available once it's gone through our regulatory and everything. So uh, stay tuned for that. We will get it out to you uh, in the near future. Thank you again, Kevin. Thank you, Smith and Nephew. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar next week. Thank you Good so night, much everybody. for all the hearts and hands. <laughs>